Um, so like, please don't even bother to raise your hand. Uh, just ask questions, shout things out, unless you're Marina, in which case, <laughs> which case maybe, 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 I don't wanna, maybe I should set a rate number. Oh, well. um, yeah, okay, so I guess like the first order of business is to gauge people's knowledge of plasma. And we all heard of plasma. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. Do, does anyone know like very intimately how it works? No. Does anyone have like a rough idea? Yeah, of course David does. Is it similar to lightning? What's that? Is it similar to lightning? Is it similar to lightning? Uh, okay, so it is a layer two. It is a layer two. Um, so it's similar uh, to lightning in the sense that it is a scaling solution which makes some additional sort of trust assumptions in return um, for like a higher throughput. Um, so that's, in, that, in that sense, it is similar uh, to layer two. Um, uh, but I think if you look at, uh, the way I'd maybe draw it would be like um, uh, payment channels uh, on one end, and then you have like uh, side chains over here. So plasma is sort of like a, com a framework to combine these two things. Um, and so a uh, disclaimer here is that Plasma has ended up talking about, like, really, especially in the Ethereum research community, a very large uh, set of, like, ideas and specs. And so there's no one, like, plasma spec. Um, it's thought of as a framework. In the same way that we think of, like, state channels are a framework. They're, like, a, a, a layer two framework. This is another layer two framework. Um, and I guess the main, uh, I guess, so, like, versus payment channels. So versus payment channels, there's, like, two big differences. One of them is that they're non-unanimous plasma chains. Uh, so what does this mean? In a payment channel, everyone has to be online, or in a, in a state channel in general, everyone has to be online and sign off on the new state update, whether or not that's a, uh, you know, the next move in a game of chess in a generalized uh, state channel, uh, whether or not that's the next micropayment in a, in, in a lightning channel. Um, but they require unanimous consent, okay? Um, plasma is different in that uh, the dispute resolution mechanism does not depend on the consent of all parties. In particular, it's about the consent of the one party owning a particular coin. Um, so that's that's one difference. I'll put this in quotes, maybe. It's a little funny way to think about it, but I'll put, so I'll put it in quotes. Uh, the other big one, and, and this is like the actual main uh, revelation of Plasma, is that it involves frequent state commitments. Um, so what does this mean? So this means that uh, unlike a unlike a uh, payment channel, it's actually not entirely off-chain. So in, a, in, in, in any plasma construction, what you have is a single hash uh, that is being submitted into a, the the sort of plasma contract uh, each each block, uh, and this hash effectively is the Merkle root of a very large number of transactions. And the goal is to design a smart contract where you're, that the smart contract that you're plugging that hash into, uh, so that once you, when you see the hash and you see one particular branch includes your transaction, you have sort of safety on that transaction. And you know that that transaction was like sort of committed to uh, and finalized in the same way uh, that in a um, payment channel, you know that it's finalized once they send you the pre-image of like the last thing. Um, or they sign off on the next state update in like Ethereum style uh, state channels. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's basically the gist of it. Um, and, and then if we think about like, um, you know, maybe another way to think about this, I, I think in general is it's really interesting to think of like layer two as like the dispute resolution court system, right? So in, in Lightning, you have, a, um, you have a requirement that before the timeout date, you need to come online and that's because if someone tries to exit an earlier uh, an earlier point in the payment channel, say where they paid you less money, uh, you can cancel it with the information they gave you in the following payments. Uh, so it is a challenge response period in um, payment channels. We use the exact same concept in Plasma to secure the Plasma change. So we introduce so like the main assumption um, is like is like a an online assumption. Um, it, it's that. Anyone who cares about not getting their money stolen comes online at some uh, at some point within a window, 
and is there to prevent anyone trying to steal their money from doing it successfully. And the construction is such that we create cryptographic, uh, we, we can create like game theoretic proofs from the cryptographic ha big giant hash tree that is this Merkleized thing that is called a plasma block. Um, okay, questions, comments, concerns so far? I'm not an expert on lightning, so I could be wrong here, but I think that you have to be online in order to receive a payment in a lightning channel. Ah, uh, yep, absolutely. Is that maintained with plasma? Um, that is not maintained with plasma. Um, you do not need that. Uh, and so one key, actually one key and really, really important differentiator, and, one, and the reason that I get so excited about plasma is this non-unanimous feature. So in, uh, in uh, lightning, for me to have some lightning coin, that requires me to set up an on-chain transaction uh, that places that money into this uh, payment channel. In Plasma, fascinatingly, that is not the case. In Plasma, I can simply be sent someone else's Plasma coin and now have that Plasma coin. Um, uh, so that's like a really powerful, powerful difference. So as far as the online, the online requirements, the one in particular that I was talking about um, is the fact that uh, you have to be basically checking the smart contract for someone to be trying to steal your money. So the, light, the online requirement that I'm talking about here is if, let's say we, uh, let's say we have a lightning channel open and I like, uh, you know, buy a taco from you one day and I buy a taco from you the next day and then I buy a third one the next day. We're up to like three updates there, right? We have like three transactions that we built and sort of canceled with the following transaction. Um, but if someone does try to exit the UTXO from the first taco, um, such that I hadn't paid them for two more tacos. Uh, I should say this the other way. If I try to exit them and only pay for one taco, even though in reality I tried to pay for two more, they swoop in and cancel that UTXO, right? So that's the property, um, that's the property that, that Lightning uses for security. So this is a similar kind of assumption. You assume that the people using the Plasma chain come online, they try to see if anyone's screwing them up, and if they are trying to screw them up, they are allowed to go and then cancel that. Um, and so that's like that's like what we call uh, like an exit game. And in both of these sort of online assumption cases, the, there's the opportunity to outsource the monitoring and that's, reduce the centralization problems as a result. Uh, Is there a difference in the two in that respect? That's a great question. Um, so. Generally speaking, the answer is yes. Um, and the reason um, for that is because uh, uh, it, you can definitely, from an infrastructural perspective, build um, a watchtower mechanism. Uh, actually, one of the very open areas of research right now in Plasma is uh, watchtower economics. Um, you have a, you basically have a, uh, you have like a race condition or like a front runnable scenario um, where if someone tries to, um, you need some way to sort of like attribute the, the, the responsibility to, to maintain your coin safety to a particular person, and it's unclear how to delegate that in a way that sort of isn't restrictive and allows you to do it yourself, but also doesn't allow some other third party to. Because if some other, th other third party could, could, they would watch for this guy to do it and jump in and cut him off and try to steal the fee. Um, so that's like a front running challenge. So the economics are a little unsure, from an infrastructure perspective, definitely can be done. I, I have like a level question. Um, so if you're sending like a what you call like a plasma coin to so like let's say you send me a plasma coin, is that like an ether like what what is it? Ah oh, great. Yep. So it can be um, basically any asset in Ethereum. It can be a fungible asset, it can be a non-fungible token even, it can be any area C20 or it can be ETH itself. And you can just send it to me without me being involved? Yes. Uh, so there's one caveat to this. Um, which is that you you should have some main chain ETH um, because you need to pay for a challenge. So if I tried to screw you over, then you need, would need to be able to tell the main Ethereum chain that you were screwed over. And so even though you get money, um, even though you like uh, you sent me money, I couldn't use it to pay a transaction fee to the miner because the, the transaction that I buying is the transaction that proves that I own the money. So the miner's not going to accept the transaction until the proof goes through and so you have this chicken and egg problem. So, so if you're sending me ETH in a plasma chain, like through a plasma transaction, it's basically yep. like you put some of that ETH into a smart contract yep. that you're now sending me. Yeah. So I think like, I think like, um, I'll take like other questions and then maybe I, we can like sketch out like, like an actual plasma construction because that's maybe like going to make this a lot more real. Is that good?
Okay, cool. Um, I guess we'll just go to Newport because I'm horrible at uh, allocating resources. Apparently. Cool. Okay. Um, so, so that was like that was like sort of a nice little intro. Um, now there's two uh, there's two plasma constructions um, that I've pretty much talked about. Um, there's something called MVP um, or minimum viable plasma, and then there's something called cache. Uh, and plasma cache is uh, Vitalik's original version vision for a scalable, secure plasma. But anyway. Um, We'll start with MVP, and then if we get to it, we, we, and we analyze some of the problems, we can talk about how cash uh, makes platform a lot better. Okay, cool. Okay, so how, so how do you build MVP? So MVP looks something like this. We have a uh, contract uh, on the Ethereum main chain. So main chain contract, okay? So we deploy this contract to the main chain. Uh, and this operator, ha this uh, sorry, this contract has um, has a few things in it. One, it has an an exit function, uh, and this is when you deposit money in. Uh, once you own, when you if you own money on the chain, the exit is what you call it to get your money out. Okay. Uh, the next thing that it has is a challenge. Okay. And, uh, and the, uh, the challenge is when someone falsely tries to exit money, you can challenge them with a challenge. And this is the, so the online requirement, the, the online assumption we talked about before, is you assume that within some period of time, someone will come online, see that someone tried to exit their money, gosh darn it, and submit the challenge. Um, and so that's the assumption we make. So we have those two things in the, the challenge. I'm confused. Uh, go ahead. So Who's participating in this contract? Like you say, someone fortunately exits. Like, yep. what does that mean exactly? Because um, if this is just like me putting money in this contract, then no one. Right. Like, okay. who has access to this? And like, how, what does that mean? So anyone can deposit yeah. money into the chain, into the contract, uh, and anyone can attempt to exit money from the contract. Um, let me add. Let me add one more thing to the story, which is something called the operator. Um, so, so in the you, you can invent more complex constructions, but in the simplest example, um, you do have one one interesting and, and kind of bad point of centralization, which is someone called the operator. Oh, you can't see? Okay, okay, okay. Let's redo it. All right, contract. Oh yeah. Okay, so you have a few things in the contract. One is an exit function. Okay, anyone, uh, and uh, maybe what I'll add here is what you call an exit on. Can you first define what you mean when you say contract? Because that encompasses an incredibly wide range of things. What's the constructor? Okay, so I, so, okay, I should back up here and say all of the plasma stuff that's being done is really being done on Ethereum. And so I made a totally bad implicit assumption, which was to assume that we were operating in Ethereum land. So when I talk about this, I mean a uh, stateful object uh, in Ethereum, that is a smart contract that has some code deployed to it um, uh, that is like static. It can't be, it can't be changed once it's sitting there. Uh, so this is a smart contract that you can send money to, and it owns the money. And if if the right opcodes work by some other calls, namely the calls to an exit, it will send the money back out to work, to wherever it is. So that's that's the framework that we're operating in. Um, so you, you have the ability to exit. You have the ability to challenge. Uh, and then you have an operator address. So this is the address of someone in particular who is called the operator of the plasma chain. Now eventually it's going to be a group of people, but for now we'll just treat it as one person. They're the operator. They're the ones um, that basically take a bunch of people's transactions, aggregate them all together uh, into a block, merkelize that block up into one thing, and then submits that block uh, to the main chain. Okay, so so the last well, the last thing we have is a so we have a submit block. Submit is that big enough for you, Rina? Can anyone do that, or is yeah. that is in particular good? needs to be done by the operator? This is a simple what we call a proof of authority plasma chain. Is the operator the contract owner? The operator is not the contract owner. The, the the contract is owned by no one. It can't be touched. And, the, and critically here, the operator cannot. The, uh, 
we hope to design the system in such a way that even if the operator is maximally malicious, they can screw you over as little as possible. Most importantly, not steal your money. And so this is the property that we, that we are going to try to derive. Um, but you can think of the operator as an owner in the sense that he is a very special person or she is a very special person uh, and she has the ability to, uh, to publish a new block. And that is the only way that a new plasma block can be created. Yes? What's the difference between an operator and a miner? An, oper an operator and a miner? Yes. Uh, yeah, very good. So a miner uh, is there to secure the consensus and keep your money safe. Uh, an operator is there um, pretty much just to, because you trust him and you think he's going to act nice. And if he acts nice, then he can batch a bunch of transactions into just one and save everyone a lot of money. But if he ends up being mean, he can't steal your money. He can just force you to, to, to do the, the transaction on the main chain after all. So you didn't get your savings, but you're still safe. Maybe we'll get to this in a second, but why do you need an operator to batch? Why is there not like some function or some way to like compromise without it? Um, the reason is because, um, so basically, yeah, we will get into this, but basically the reason is because all of the, um, Everything that we're going to do in constructing this contract is going to be to keep the operator from screwing you over. And the main way, one of the big ways that the operator can screw you over is they submit like some hash. They submit hash here, which is supposed to be a Merkle tree of, of, of things. Um, but what they might do is they might not give you the Merkle, the Merkle root. And this ends up being the problem that's very, very tricky. So the reason it can't be anyone is because if we allowed anyone to do that, the first person to publish a new block and not reveal the contents underneath would cause the whole system to halt, and everyone would have to call exit to get their money out. They would still be safe, but it would be very, very easily griefable. So because of that, to avoid this griefing vector, we're going to particularly look for operators that uh, have some sort of public voice that a lot of people use that we trust to be actually running their software as is desired. Now, if they don't, again, they can't screw us out of money, but they can they can grief us effectively. And so this is to prevent any random person from grief. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Okay. So let's actually talk about like the construction now that we've done this. So so uh, so basically, it looks like this. Um, oh, I guess I guess what I should add here um, is deposit. This is kind of like implicit, but actually, actually, it's kind of important. There's also a deposit, um, a deposit thing. So, what does this whole workflow look like in practice? Well, it looks something like this. I have some ETH. I want to spend it in Plasma. What do I do? I, I give it to deposit, and my money gets locked in this contract. It's not owned by the operator. It can't be touched by the operator, but it's locked in this contract. And when I deposit, that gives me a UTXO in what we call the plasma chain, okay? So a deposit can give us uh, a UTXO. Uh, now, let's say I want to send, let's say, you know, like, like let's say this is like, you know, you know, Alice's UTXO, right? Let's say Alice, Alice wants to send him some money to Bob. Alice does the following. Uh, Alice uh, creates a transaction, um, you know, taking, taking Alice and spending it to Bob, right? So it goes, it goes something like that. Um, for this to be a valid transaction, what I do is I sign the trans. Alice signs the transaction. Says I want to give this money to Bob. Uh, Alice gives that that transaction uh, to the operator, and the operator includes it in a very large Merkle tree uh, of things up and up, blah blah. blah and submits that Merkle tree to submit block in the next block. And I wait, and, Al, and Bob says, well, Alice didn't send me their money yet. But once, but once Bob says, aha, I see Alice's transaction included in some Merkle leaf, included in a future block, uh, then Bob knows that their money is safe. And that is the property that, that is property we're hoping for, and that's sort of how Plasma works as a, uh, as a scheme. Uh, OK, so how on earth? Uh, how on earth do we actually enforce that? Uh, well, the way we do it is we require. Um, well, maybe maybe I'll maybe I'll just draw this draw this out as a uh, as a sort of more structured thing. Okay, 
So there's sort of like two, there's like sort of two parts. There's like main chain, and then there's like a plasma chain. Uh, and what happens is you get each, each block on the main chain, each block on the main chain, you get just one thing, one hash, which is submit block being called. <laughs> and, every, and, every, and, and every block on the main chain, that's called by the operator only once. And within that, that block is the block hash of the plasma block. And a plasma block is, um, is a list of transactions, like Alice saying to Bob, um, you know, Carol spending to uh, whatever the D is in cryptography, naming schemes, and so on. Um, well, really, I'm going to do it this way. Sorry for changing it up. Alice saying to Bob, that's one transaction. Maybe we have another one. You know, that Carol wants to send some money, and so uh, you know, and so on. And we have a bunch of these, and these all get Merkleized up and turned into a Merkle Merkle root, which is the thing that is submitted to the chain. So every, every main chain block, we have this commitment of many transactions in the plasma chain, of the plasma block, committed up into the main chain. Question? No, oh, no just, no. just a chain. OK. OK, so that sounds, so that sounds, yeah. I have a question. So uh, you're getting performance, so again, it's just going from what I was saying. So you're getting performance because the operator essentially doesn't need to do the consensus, right? Correct. So the operator, I guess. So the point of this system is to allow the operator to optimistically batch a bunch of transactions together, but still have the safety properties of the main chain. So we still rely on this main chain for safety, because we rely on the safety of the exits and of the challenges. But the operator, we let them deal with the submit block structure. And we let them group a bunch of these transactions into just one thing. Up to this point, all the operators doing it is what a kind of standing service. The operator is absolutely only timestamping, and that's it. Yes. That's all the operator is there to do. It's there to timestamp transactions. That's all he does. Well, is <laughs> correctness and false? Ah, okay. So that's the fun part. So let's get to exit and challenge. So let's say uh, let's say we have a few blocks here, um, whatever. So we have this block happen, um, and then we have uh, uh, this block happen. Um, so let's say uh, that Alice submitted here um, to, to Bob, and then maybe Bob, uh, we have a Bob to, uh, uh, I don't know, Zed, okay? And Bob sent it to Zed, and now Zed receives some plasma coins, but Zed wants to get their money out. So how does Zed get their money out? In the next block, uh, Zed calls an exit, on this, on this transaction. Not just the transaction, but on the exact uh, Merkle uh, branch of the transaction in the plasma block. So, so, so Z wants to exit. Z's transaction, uh, Merkle, Z's Merkle branch uh, is called on an exit. So you also have a, you know, you have a new plasma block here. Wait, but, so what so, are the inputs to exit, challenge, and submit block? So the input to exit uh, is the Merkle path to a transaction it previously included in the plasma chain. So it is a, it is a, it is a, a Merkle branch um, that was in one of the previous blocks. So that's what you call exit with. Um, we'll get to what you call challenge with. It's, it's effectively the same. Uh, yeah. So it's like to refer to the UTXO that you're you trying to spend. So it's just to refer to the UTXO that you're spending. Exactly right. All I'm doing is I say, look, all Zed is saying is, look, Bob, send me some money. Uh, I want out because I don't want to participate in the plasma anymore. So I want to pull my money out. Okay. So 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 Zed submits that exit, right? So again, to use the timestamp analogy, you're just using the path as proof that you have that transaction. Exactly right. You say, look, at this time in the past. I'm Zed and I was sent this money, therefore it's mine, booyah, I'm getting out of here, right? Um, and so we call, this, we call this an exit. And in this case, um, if, if, if this is how everything is played out, this exit would go through. However, we have to make sure that someone can't use this exit mechanism to steal your money. So what we do is that when someone exits, 
they're going to wait. Uh, they're going to wait for what we call a challenge period. And this can be short or long. It's a security parameter of the system. Uh, it's equivalent to how, like, when the, 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 hash, the time lock part of the hash time lock contract in a Lightning, uh, it's equivalent to that. It is the amount of time that you have to wait before uh, your money is actually let go. It's a challenge period in which, if Zed was trying to screw us over, the rightful owner of Zed's money could come in and nix it. Um, so this is like, we, we kind of go for two weeks as a ballpark, ballpark randomly throw another number. It can be parameterized as we see the security um, desires of, of users. Um, and exit is called on the Ethereum chain? Yes, so exit is called on the main Ethereum chain, up here. It is called in the contract on the Ethereum main chain itself. So presumably at the start, deposit is also called on the main chain. That's right, and I added, I added that here, and I should have added that perhaps yeah. earlier on, but both deposit and exit are, are done on the main chain, yeah. What's the structure of the Merkle tree? Like is it, if you spend the UTXO, is the parent in the Merkle tree going to be the, trans the transaction center? Or? Ah, so this is, so it is a Merkle tree of transactions. Yeah. So it is just the list of in this model. So actually, uh, if you structure it better, you can get better security properties, and we'll talk about that. But in the naive uh, sort of MVP, all it is is just each each uh, each leaf of the Merkle branch is just all the is just a transaction. It's just a list of transactions Merkleized into a big root or into a, a fixed size root. Actually, is the whole point, right? Um, right. Okay. So that's what we do. And so we wait two weeks, and if no one calls challenge on it within those two weeks. Uh, then bada bing bada boom, we're good to go, and uh, Zed gets their money out. Okay, so can anyone think of the way why without a challenge this is horribly, horribly broken? How would you how would you take money from the system if no one was calling a challenge? I, I send you, well you send me like a hundred plasma cash, and then I have to pay you later, so I can just... Yep, so, 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 so the danger is that Instead of getting an exit at the end, we get an exit that's early. So let's say they try to exit. Well, Bob had the money back here, but they sent it to Zed. So that can't be a valid transaction. Um, so what can you submit to an exit? Uh, an exit, when you call an exit, what you call it on is a, um, a spend of the UTXO. spend of the UTXO being exited. So if, if let's say Bob tried to exit here, then the same Merkle, the same Merkle branch that, was, that would be used to exit by Zed is now used to challenge. So let's say Bob was trying to steal money. Bob calls exit and provides this uh, Merkle branch. I guess it was supposed to be that one, but whatever. They provide this Merkle branch and they say, I want to exit this money. It's mine, gosh darn it. And then, uh, and then two weeks goes by, and somewhere in that two-week time period, it is challenged with this. And the smart contract can easily see, oh, yep, Bob signed the transaction. We see Bob's signature on this thing. We know that Bob uh, like sent that money, and it's not Bob's anymore, so we're going to cancel this exit. So the challenge is there to prevent that exit from being able to occur. Uh, and that is uh, is... Uh, the basis for how we build plasma systems. It's all about a challenge period that where your money is locked up and an exit period. What if uh, Zed sends back to the vault again? Uh, if Zed sends back to vault? Well, just having a signature is not sufficient, right? Because then you can replay it. Like if what? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So it has to be the, with this particular transaction signed. And it has to be that the transaction is validly included in a later block than the one being challenged. Okay, okay, right. so the smart contract checks that. The smart contract checks when, okay. when it sees this challenge, it checks that this challenge was included, indeed included, and it checks that the spend happened after the attempted exit, and that is how we know that it's blocked. David? What is the worst case weight on the main chain for like doing an exit? If I want to exit, I have to like prove that the spend is mine and someone else is trying to take it. Like, What's the worst? How many bytes does this prove that I'm throwing out of the main chain to exit? 
How many bytes is this proof? Uh, um, it's a good question. So the answer is um, it's on the order of the log of number of transactions per block. Uh, because, uh, because what it is, is it is um, some transaction data plus, uh, you know, so if you have like a, um, so if you have like a Merkle branch, right? I actually, so I'm actually a, a weirdo and I really like drawing Merkle branches um, left, left uh, aligned. I know that's, that's like people find that unusual, but I think if you shift everything that way, it's better. So like if I wanted to prove inclusion of this thing, um, I have to give this hash, I have to give this hash, I have to give this hash, this hash, this hash, and that is, that is the root that was submitted. So, um, so it's on order, so this is um, the number, the amount of data is all of these things for an exit or a challenge. And so, because it, it's just a Merkle branch, and along with it, you know, the actual transaction at the bottom, right? But, but barring that, so, uh, so this data structure, um, the number of things that this is, is logarithmic in the total number of transactions. So it's on the order of log of the number of transactions. The more transactions we want to through, shove through the plasma chain, the taller this tree has to get to include more, and so the more data it is. But so that proves that it's in one block. But don't you have to prove that the spend within the block is valid? So you need more history than just proving your. Uh, what do you mean you need to prove that the spend is valid? Because we don't. If I understand correctly, we don't assume that the operator, the blocks that they're publishing automatically valid. Like if, if the operator publishes an invalid block, uh, then the operator can prove that some transaction exists or, or not. Okay, so 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 you're, you're jumping the gun and you're, you're totally totally right. Oh, no, um, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's it's great because it was the next it was the next piece <laughs> I wanted to go to. Um, so this system is really cool, but it turns out it's still broken as crap. It feels pretty secure at this point, right? How on earth is someone gonna steal mice? Um, well, it turns out that like it is very, very much uh, broken, and the reason is effectively because the operator can just do whatever the heck it wants, and you don't know, and that really that really becomes the root of the problem. So the, the particular attack is what if the operator goes, hmm, I've been including all these valid transactions that everyone's giving me. What if I just included an invalid transaction? So imagine, so imagine uh, a block where we have a transaction that's just like an out of, we call it an out of nowhere spend in Plasma. This is, this is the root of the problem. If suddenly, uh, if suddenly um, you know, there's a transaction that says, uh, you know, Alice sent you know, 25,000 ETH uh, to, to, oh, the operator, right? If we, if we, if we take this, and we and that, that thing gets merkleized up and it gets included in the main chain, right? If that happens, um, then we could call exit on it, and that would be really, really, really bad because what if Alice never had the twenty-five thousand in the first place? Um, so that ends up being the problem that is truthfully very poorly solved in this um, MVP plasma that we're talking about. Um, but that is that is the main problem that we have to solve. It's called an out of nowhere. Uh, it is called an out of nowhere spend. It's where, forget the valid transactions, the operator can put whatever they want in there, so they just put, because the, remember, the main chain has no idea what it is that the operator has put in. The operator could put, like, not a Merkle group, they could put just a random number in there, and, and, and the main chain would never know. It's the whole point of the system is that the main chain doesn't care, it doesn't have to check anything about what the operator gives until people start having disputes about whose coins are who. And only then does the operator go in and say, okay, I'm gonna send my feelers in and figure out what the heck is going on down here. Um, so this ends up being, this out of nowhere spend ends up being uh, the very, very, very significant problem um, that's introduced in this construction of plasma as we've described it so far. Um, yes, so does that make sense everyone? Why this would be, why this would be a vulnerability? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, outside of that, isn't mentioned before that the operator could like uh, lower like throughput by at least submitting like on the one transaction block or like a cut down version of this tree. Um, could there be like some attacks where you're like timing different transactions at different, like instead of submitting a full tree, you're submitting like small subsets and then allowing, like if you're colluding with somebody on the chain, they can, uh, they can see it try and exit can. and then there's no challenge branch because it's not been published yet. Yes, so, so this is the out of nowhere spend and it's the main thing to talk about in Plasma to keep things simple. 
Now, the, the other problem, which is pretty much effectively what you described, is uh, the more general class of problems that, uh, or, or of attacks that the operator has available to them, which is called a data withholding attack. What if on the main chain we see like a random number here and we have no idea where it came from? It's just a number. And, the, and we ask the operator, he's like, oh, doesn't say anything. That would be a huge issue as well. Um, one of the ways that this is an issue is if I try to send, it's called an in-flight transaction. If I, if, I'm, if I think that I'm here and I create a transaction that I want to be included here, uh, and then the operator just goes away and publishes some random thing and doesn't tell me what it is, it withholds the data, I don't know if my transaction that I gave him was included or not. But it might be. So what might happen is I say, oh, well, I guess the operator didn't include my transaction. He went offline. I'm going to exit. And then I try to exit the UTXO, and the operator all of a sudden is like, aha, no. It was, it, was, it was included, I did include it, I just didn't show you. And then he challenges it and cancels it, and then he griefs you. So that's like a, um, that's, that, that's like a griefing attack, and in Plasma you, you have a pretty large number of what we would call one-to-one -one, like capital lockup griefing attacks, where the operator can sort of screw you as much as he screws himself by the challenge. Um, but we have lots of those classes of attack. And, and, and uh, the, that data withholding problem is the same thing that makes, um, for example, doing like a generalized um, virtual machine kind of um, stateful blockchain as a plasma chain, that ends up getting really hard as well. Because what do you do when you see, when the operator just is malicious and doesn't share with you the data that he just uploaded the root of? Um, and what are, the, what are the various attacks that go on there? Yeah. Um, OK, other questions, comments? Is yeah. There, so is there a challenge to the challenge here? So if I submit, uh, there is a challenge here that submit transaction saying that's the latest, but then someone else can come in and say, no, I have another one. So how long does that Yeah, so that's, a, so, that's, so that's great. And that, and that comes to the root. So that's, that might be one way that you could tackle this problem. And I think in some ways, in principle, you could like theoretically say that you've got security now, but it turns out to be a very bad system. But this, this is exactly one thing you can do. What we could do is we could, we could add a new type of challenge on this, on this spend, which says, uh, which when someone tries to exit this, you submit a challenge and you go, uh-uh, that, that, that coin has an invalid history. Um, and you say, Alice never had the 25,000. Prove that Alice had the 25,000. And, uh, and, and if there's nothing, if, there's no, if, the, if this uh, transaction isn't pointing to a previous UTXO um, that is by Alice, uh, that, is, that was sent to Alice with you know, 25 KG, so I hope you guys can back and see that. So if, if this if this UTXO wasn't spending, if one of its inputs wasn't a transaction with 25 KB, uh, then we would invalidate that exit as well. And so that's exactly how we might we might prevent this kind of attack from happening. Um, that's definitely a What's that? So if uh, so, let, let me put it this way. That turns out to be an okay to be an okay way of doing. Uh, uh, it turns out to not be a good way of doing things. Because you might have this. You might have a bunch of, un of withheld blocks. And a bunch of withheld blocks. Uh, and all of them get included. And what, what the operator did in this, in this one was they included this. And then they included, um, uh, they, they spent all that money to themselves. And then they spent uh, all that money to themselves again. Uh, right? Uh, and they just kept, they kept doing this for, for a while. And then they tried to exit this. So the problem is, even though my seat, your selection would work in principle, you have to do three challenges. You have to go three challenges deep to be able to get to it, right? Because if I try to exit this, I can make, I can, we can try to construct a challenge where I go, uh-uh, O didn't have the 25K. Uh, prove to me that the input was valid. And then the operator goes, oh, OK, sure. It, it was valid. It's right here. And then we'd have to go, no, but this one is invalid. And then you have to go, sure, OK. And then finally, we'd catch him, right? We would catch him here, because this doesn't exist. But the problem is, is that that is not a fixed number of rounds. And so over a week, if the challenge period is, is, is two weeks, over two weeks, the operator could do this every single time for two weeks. And you'd have to trace back to two weeks worth of transactions. And so it would be horrible scalability. And the other problem with it is that, um, you have to make it be with you have to make it be within that window. You can't just like arbitrarily let it sit because eventually people have to get their money out. 
And so if you allowed this arbitrary nesting of history challenges, um, what you would end up, what would end up happening would be that when I tried to exit my money, if someone could screw me by like, just like trolling me, be like, ah, that's not valid, it doesn't have valid history. I'd be like, well, yeah, it does. He'd be like, ah, that was not valid, okay, yeah. And he'd just keep doing that over and over again, and I'd never get my money out. So this turns out not to be um, a great way to solve this problem. Unfortunately, the solution to it that was originally proposed, I think, is also um, quite bad. The solution, the solution as proposed in the original MVP is as follows. Uh, I want to talk just a minute. I think it's approaching nine. So, oh, sure. Could you get into plasma and cash? Sure. That, that was basically what I was going to go into. Okay. So, I'll, 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 I'll treat it very, very quickly. I'll, I'll talk about what, what, it, what it does. Um, so, the way that MVP solved this was something called a mass exit. And it was, just, it was just the following it was just like, oh, we don't really know what to do, honestly. Let's increase the assumptions. How do we do that? If this, if this appears, everyone has to exit. <laughs> That was the solution that, 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 that is proposed. And that is something that like, people um, are pushing to production plasma. And I don't know if it's an unreasonable assumption or not. It's not very good. It could be better. Um, but basically, um, basically, what we just say is, if you see this, you must, everyone must exit their money. Everyone, you got to go. You got to go. This is an evacuation. The operator has screwed up. Your money's not, no good anyway, so get it out now. The problem is, is if the network was really congested, like CryptoKitties was booming and there were you know, more ICOs, unfortunately, and if they, that kind of thing were to happen, you might not be able to get all the exits out. Um, and so that ends up being a big, um, that ends up being a big attack vector, and this is what was solved with Plasma Cache. Okay, so how does, so how does Plasma Cache work? So Plasma Cache effectively um, was a reinterpretation uh, of how we treat these UTXOs. I, I, I almost in some sense could argue that it's like a, it's like an improved plasma-friendly transaction format. Um, and I'll just sort of, I'll, I'll just sort of uh, like visually go over how, how I, I intuit the, the way Plasma works in, in, in my head. But basically the proposal of Plasma, uh, the proposal of Plasma Cash was instead of all of this money being a sort of amalgamous blob that there were UTXOs of and transactions being spent and created and all that stuff, what if instead of all of that, we, we, we set up the, 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 the coins as non-fungible tokens? Where each deposit is distinct. So when I place money in the um, when I place money in this version of Plasma, it was just like, you know, let's say there was you know 25 ETH, right? There's 25 ETH, and then someone deposits five, then like now there's 30 ETH, and like that's about all we said about the money that was in the pool. In Plasma Cash, what we do is the following: we say that the first um, we basically say that coins are sort of like on a number line. Okay, it's very weird, but it ends up working. So we say the first five ETH, like that's this section right here, and it's owned by like this guy. And like, you know, the next 10 ETH, well, that's owned by this other guy. And then the next 20, and then the next 20 ETH, well, you know, maybe that's owned by some other person. And so imagine that, and so now when I do a transaction, I transact a particular range of coins instead of just some coins. Um, and so let's say I want to transact here. So uh, the next, so if, if this transaction occurred and it was sent this way, for example, then we would have um, a chain that looked like this. It would look like that, sorry. It would look like that, and then so on. So this part went from sort of smooth squiggly to jagged, right? And so that was like me transferring my coin to that. And what that, what that means um, is that is basically um, it prevents this, this sort of mystery thing from happening. Because now when you call exit, you call exit on a start point and an end point. OK? You call exit on a start and an end point. So now, like, you know, we'll call this Alice, this person Alice, this person Bob, this person Charlie, right? Now, if, Bob, if, uh, if Alice wants to exit their coins, they have to specify that you know coins um, five through ten through ten were, were, were the ones that they want to exit. They specify it's this exact range, and what that ends up doing is it, allow, it, it, it allows um, it allows for the, the out of nowhere money to be created to now have a rightful owner. The problem with creating twenty five thousand ETH out of thin air to myself is that no one knew whose money was being stolen. What really happened was that money was created out of thin air, like a fractional reserve, and when the money was drained out of the uh, account, 
everyone had less ETH in the contract left over on the main chain than the total amount of UTXOs that they had in the plasma chain um, because there was no attribution. But what you do in this model is you specify ranges of coins, very specific ranges of coins. And so for me to, for me to exit coins, I'm not withdrawing just any coins. I'm withdrawing this five through 10 coins in particular. Um, and because of that, if Bob tries to exit this range, uh, it can now be challenged with this transaction, with this transaction here. Now critically, if there's something here and we don't know what it is, uh, we add the following condition. Um, a coin's history stops, it halts, it is no longer spendable if there is ever a transaction that isn't pointed to previously. Okay? So let's say, let's say um, Alice owns these coins here, and then we, we don't know what happens, uh, and then like, you know, you know, a new player comes in and tries to exit these. He's like, claims, claims ownership of coins 5 through 10. Says, I want to get these out, these are mine. What Bob does is say, oh yeah? Check it out. This transaction right here, I was, I was sent the money here. This is my money. So the challenge is I give, I give that and I say, prove to me, prove to the contract that I ever spent this money. Those are my coins, gosh darn it. And, this, and no matter what was included here, if Alice never signed a transaction, Alice knows that even though they can't see what's, what's, what's included in the next block, they know it couldn't have been a transaction of their money. And so if we, if we would prevent exits when there's a transaction in a, in a coin range's history that doesn't have a spend, then we invalidate everything past that. And it's like almost like a way to detect that the operator was dead with holding. Um, yeah, and so that is, in a, in a very quick summary, the way that we deal with this mass exit vulnerability is we give an actual attribution uh, or like a history to the coins so that very specific coins are challengeable by very specific people. Yeah. Uh, so in that example you just gave, uh, Bob doesn't really have any incentive to like publish that because it's no longer his money anyways. So could that be broadcast by anybody, uh, preferably the person who owns that section now? I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Like in the example, you've got somebody trying to exit and Bob is the one publishing the proof that uh, he spent from or like to that range, or within that range. Yep. Uh, but Alice is the current owner at that point, so... So, and so it actually would be Alice that would be, that would be presenting that proof. Okay. It would 100% be Alice. And, and the property the Plasma Cache has is that before you own a coin, you download the entire history of that particular range's transactions. Any transaction that touched this range, for me to be confident I can exit it, I need to download everything and make sure that was, there was never a transaction that, was, wasn't, that wasn't spent. Because if it wasn't spent, then anyone can challenge with that unspent output. Um, and so very specifically, it would, it would in fact be Alice who would, who would do the challenge. And Alice has to be sure to download all of the blocks up to this point here before Alice you know, like gives the car or whatever the actual thing that they're accepting money for, for them to actually do that, for the thing that they actually do. Uh, yes. When you said that, like it's locked between after the block and the question marks, does that mean that we just ignore the block with the question marks, or that the money will be resolved into the um, Like, can the money never be spent now? Um, the money like must. The money must be exited. Yeah. So you never. So because the operator can always just go offline and stop producing blocks, the operator all you, you we're operating under a trust model no matter what, where the operator always has the ability to force everyone to exit their money and force them to like, move to a new plasma contract. Because fundamentally, the operator can always stop and say, nope, I'm not producing any more blocks, I don't care what you say, sorry. And because of that, like, it's always possible for the operator to, to another way of saying it is the operator could just say, screw you, I'm not including your transactions. I just never include your transactions. So, the, so yes, the operator can make money illiquid for that two week exit period. The operator always is going to be able to do that. How is this different than like a chain of UTXOs? Like, let's say at the beginning, like A, B, and C deposit, and they all get a UTXO that's like 5, 10, and 20. And then when uh, B sells to A, and A now has a UTXO that says 5, and then 5, and then B has one that's smaller now, right? So the, the, the reason is- Do you get anything out of having this underlying format? You, abs you absolutely do. The reason is because when I want to construct an out of nowhere spend that says I, I have 25,000 ETH, if it's just a UTXO that just says amount 25,000 UTXO, there's no way to like figure out who the money was stolen from. This ended up being the root of it. Just because you created like an inflationary UTXO out of thin air, no one could challenge it because no one could say that they were the rightful owner of that money because it wasn't like anyone's rightful money. It was just 
it was just a, like a UTXO. And, um, and so what this model does is like when I get a UTXO, the UTXO is not just a UTXO with five coins. It is a UTXO that says I own the coins from, from point, from at the start range five and at the end range 10. I own that specific range of coins. And like those are like non-fungible in the sense that coin five through 10, like once I have that transaction, every, every transaction of the coins below this all have to have this history and like we verify its integrity to know that the coin is really owned by them. So it's it's effectively like you're adding another parameter onto the transaction format, which is like the start point and the end point. So it's not just a balance, it's actually a start point and an end point on this range of coins, which represents basically the, the point far back in history in which it was very first deposited. Yeah. Uh, how do you prevent the operator from selling the same range to two different people uh, at the same time? The operator from selling the range. And so the way that a range is created is with a deposit. The operator cannot create the range. Right. When I call deposit on the main chain and I put my money in, that creates a new range, pops it on the end, right? So like if D wanted to put the money in, they would, they would go to the main chain, call deposit, and it would create a new D range here. And the operator can't screw it, like the operator never touches it, it just is created by that, by that main chain transaction. So isn't there like a kind of a double spend where the operator could, uh, you know, own a range through, through a civil uh, and sell it to two different people and include both those transactions in the uh, market? Um, so there are many constructions in which the op there are many like attack vectors in which the operator can like can like create faulty blocks and causes people's money to be halted. Um, but the intuition for that is like, can the operator include double spends? Yes. But the exit game ensures that double spends invalidate, invalidate anything that happens in the future of those double spends. So like, um, so, so the answer is, can the operator do funky things? Yes. But what the operator can't do is spend money. They can basically force a transaction to be included or prevent it from being included, but they can't do anything more than that. So another way of saying this is, um, let's say you were buying, a, uh, let's say I was buying an apple from you, right? And I, and I made a transaction and I gave it to the plasma operator uh, and you looked at it and you waited for payment. If the operator includes it, you're good, you give me the apple. But if the operator includes it along with a double spend, then you wouldn't give me the apple. And so it's just, it, that's basically that intuition. So in that case, the operator is somehow obliged to uh, provide the uh, full recent transaction history so that people can verify that the monthly commitment doesn't contain contributions. Absolutely right. Anytime you accept okay. money, you go to the operator and you, or, or, or the, the person you're getting money from, do it in the hour. But in practice, what it looks like is anytime you're receiving money on Plasma, you go to the operator and you say, hey, give me the entire coin's history. I want to accept this coin, but I don't know if I can yet. And he says, sure, and he gives it to you. And that will be, uh, that will be the origination source of fee markets on Plasma. Plasma operators will take fees for providing that very real service. Okay, so we'll we'll probably yeah, end it. I know we have time. Yeah. yeah, so we'll probably end it here, or, or maybe just ask one more question, yeah, and then we'll that move that on. Sure, um, so the operator would be a trusted reputation entity, as opposed to anybody who puts a deposit to be bonded, which could be slash. Do you have any intuition as to why? Uh, okay. Depending on a trusted third party. So, so, th so that, that's great. So, so the, the, I, I would I would add very keenly that this is not a trusted third party, uh, or or the trust assumptions that we make on the third party are just that they don't uh, that they don't um, lock up your money for two weeks. That's effectively the worst that that person can do. They can never steal your money, but they can lock it up for about two weeks. Um, and this is the same as when you enter a a, a lightning like thing, someone can try to exit an earlier UTXO and you'd have to go in and cancel it. It's just a little different in that that person is like the same but person for a lot of people, mainly the operator. However, our long -term, the long term vision for Plasma is to replace the operator um, with a proof of stake system. So you introduce some sort of um, staking token or it could even be, well there, there's reasons to make it a, a staking token. Um, and then like basically have, instead of one operator sign off and submit that, all of the operators in this peer-to-peer -peer network all sign off on that being the next box, and then that is the block production. So in theory, we want a decentralized block production um, to prevent the trust. But again, the whole point to stress is that the, the trust model that Plasma op operates on is 
The operator is really, really nice, and he can help you batch a bunch of transactions. He can also be mean and not do the transactions, but he can't steal your money. And that's the key property that we preserve, is we have all the security properties of the main chain. Well, I wonder, can the operator censor a transaction? If the operator the absolutely can censor. transaction was illicit. The operator absolutely can censor, and that's one of the main um, reasons to go to proof of stake, is, to, is the way that you avoid censorship, is you have multiple operators. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, if you have more questions, then definitely, if Ben's around, then just ask him after. But, cool, thanks guys. Yeah. Yeah.